All right, so uh, if you were here for my last talk, you already saw these pictures, but hey, sorry. So I'm Langdon White. I was a developer advocate for RHEL. Um, I came with the odd qualification that I've done production applications in almost every major language, uh, with the exception of Python, uh, which is kind of entertaining. Um, so yeah, so I did that for a while, and then I kind of moved into engineering to try to help uh, improve the developer experience for users of RHEL primarily. Uh, and then I moved into uh, working on the uh, Fedora Next project. Um, and I've been kind of working on that for a long time. Uh, and I'm the modularity objective lead. All right, so um, hopefully not too many people here have heard this before. But um, so basically, the world that we're kind of operating in has been changing over the years. Um, and it's shifting to be much more developer focused. Um, you know, as we've seen with the rise of containers, uh, it's, um, we have these monster stacks that we build our applications on top of, very thin layer almost these days on most applications. Um, the way we do software development has changed in that we can basically delete entire architectures and rebuild them uh, in you know, a matter of days, if not weeks. Um, versus months and years. Um, the software as we distribute it in distributions has kind of a single use case uh, for the most part and it takes and it's not very discoverable if there is available other versions or alternate use cases that you might want. Uh, and so um, you know a lot of these things are starting to kind of come to a head and so what we see is results like the uh, advent of containers, right? So it's not so much that containers, uh, you know, whether containers are good, bad, or indifferent, it's more that they're obviously a clear reaction to restrictions placed on developers on how they can uh, build and deploy their software. Um, there's other examples as well, but that's kind of one of the clearest ones that clearly the distros are doing something wrong if you need things like containers in order to be able to run the applications they want to run in the way they want to run them. Um, so, that's at least my opinion. So moving on, um, we have, uh, you know, sorry, I, I was a slide behind. Um, so now we're starting to see as well that um, the containers um, are kind of going all over the place, right? So we have this, this huge growth in types of containers uh, with different trade-offs and different use cases. Um, you know, so you kind of have like Rocket, I would say, is like the clearest example of something that is heavily targeted at sysadmins for deployment. Docker was heavily targeted at um, developers um, kind of bypassing the sys administration. Um, then you have also things like Snaps and Flatpaks, which is trying to do uh, basically application isolation on the desktop. Um, and these are all kind of overlapping functionalities, but they're not the same, right? They're, they have different trade-offs, different goals. Um, and you'll probably start to see them uh, come together. And we have to some extent already, right? Like OCI is starting to try to set a standard uh, for at least the outputs, even if the goals are, are kind of different. Um, and then Cryo is kind of a newer one that's uh, really specifically targeted for running, uh, you know, kind of cluster set, cluster um, containers, in a sense. Um, or clusters of containers, I guess is a better way to put it. Um, so you have a bunch of these different solutions um, that clearly, like I said, I think clearly show that there's a gap in what the Linux distribution is giving you on a server um, that these things are trying to solve. However, the problem with a lot of these is that there's really, it's really difficult to know what's in there or why it works, right? Um, so we can look at it from the outside and we can do lots of things to try to make it safer Right? So for example, you know, there's a big push around with like Cryo, for example, uh, to make sure that you know, having privilege inside the container doesn't mean you can have privilege outside the container. Um, so those are all great, right? but that doesn't tell you if you have a SQL injection error. Right? I mean, it doesn't defend you at all. Okay? So, um, and if you don't really know what's exactly in the content inside, it can be really dangerous, especially as the model around containers a lot of the time is people are encouraged to just pick something up off the shelf and start using it without having a good idea of its provenance. So these are, these are dangerous and I think these are things that are getting solved um, and will be solved over time. But it still kind of shows that there's, um, you know, that the things that we've been doing in the distro to ensure 
the, uh, this problem not happening um, isn't working for what developers and sysadmins need today. So, however, there's kind of the flip side, or sorry, and to, to kind of further add on to that, we have this curation, right? We, we say in Fedora, we work on making sure that we know the provenance of something, we make sure that when you ask for something, you get what you think you're getting, we sign it, you have a trusted partner, all these things. And again, we're starting to see some of that stuff in the container world, um, but the distros already have it. So how can we try to start to marry these things? Um, and the project I lead, right, is the modularity project. Um, but what I wanted to show in this talk is here are some other distros of what they're doing, um, which in my opinion is the, trying to solve the same problem in different, in other ways. Um, and, you know, obviously it's always good to look at other people's solutions to figure out, you know, where the gaps in yours are. So here is how they're changing. Um, this was the best I could do for a changing picture, you know, so I just turned it on side. Um, so Amazon Linux 2 um, Extras is the first one, and then SUSE Modules is another one we'll talk about, and then Gwix and Nix. I'm sure there are others, but these are kind of the ones that I thought were interesting uh, for this talk. So the idea here is um, they make alternate versions of software available. Uh, they do it with um, basically creating, it's, it's kind of weird how it works, but basically there are new repos enabled when you want that piece of software. So you want the latest version of Postgres, um, and then you uh, basically enable the topic, and now a new repo is added uh, that has uh, this newer version of Postgres and any dependencies that it has. Um, and so there are, oh, not, I meant to, I meant to count them. I want to say there's like 20 of these at this point, um, give or take. And, you know, so you can have, but you can have multiple versions of things. You'll get two different repos. Um, and, you know, so you have Postgres 9's available, for example, and then Postgres, I think it's actually 9.6 and 9.8, as well as Postgres 10, right? So you have different versions available, and you kind of can turn them on and off using this new special command called um, Amazon Linux Extras. Um, and you enable the topic, you enable the version, and that's how you get it. Um, so, and depending on how much time we'll have, I'll demo it, but um, let's see. Oh, and uh, so packages can also override, right? So you can have something in these repositories that is um, overriding what's in the base. So it has a few problems that, in my opinion, of uh, how it works. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that in the, when you run the application itself, uh, it warns you not to turn on too many of these, um, which I think is kind of concerning. Um, in all the documentation, and I will say, working for Red Hat, I think we have this problem a little bit too, but in all the documentation, it, it warned over and over again that this is not supported in production. Um, and so if you use any of this stuff, it's not supported, etc. I don't know if that'll change. You know, maybe it's kind of the tech preview transitioning to uh, production usage, but. Um, the, the part that concerned me was the, if you have too many, it will not work. One of the other key differences that I think that modularity does um, that this doesn't do is that if I enable, um, if I enable the kind of, uh, I'm trying to think how to say this. So um, there's no, there's kind of no sticking to the stream in a sense, right? So it's whatever's in the repository is just available. There's no tracking about the fact that, you know, I'm on Postgres 8 and I now have been upgraded to Postgres 9. It just happens and it's silent just like a normal RPM update. Um, this is one of the key things I think with modularity is that you are warned before you do an upgrade um, so that you can choose to switch streams. Um, the other concern, and we actually would have had this problem, but we, we were concerned about it, is that it's a repository repository per topic. Um, and the problem with that is that both DNF and YUM start falling down um, pretty hard when you have a large number of repositories. So if you move your whole system to using these topics, you would end up with you know, 30, 40, 50 repositories, um, and the package management tooling doesn't actually handle large numbers of repositories very well. Go ahead. Let me do 700. Sorry? 700 repositories can be known. You've used 700 repositories yes, in DNF? Yes, yes. Um, this is a DNF that, so. 
Yes. Okay, so uh, the point was made that we can do 700 uh, repositories in DNF. Um, I know when we tested it, uh, I guess a couple yeah. years ago, it definitely could not. Um, so, um, so. Uh, yeah, so actually, um, so the comment was they use Yum and Amazon. Um, when I was digging around, uh, I actually think both are available. Um, but I don't, I don't know if Yum is just a sim link to DNF like Fedora's been doing, um, because I, I, didn't, I missed getting to that step. I was really surprised. It doesn't read the rest, I can assume that. Yeah, so apparently maybe 700 repos is fine. Um, I'm surprised. Um, so, oh, and then the other thing that um, I was, uh, was interesting, and I, I couldn't quite figure out how this hook worked, but basically if I say, um, yum, or sorry, um, you know, kind of Amazon Linux extras install. Um, oh no, that's how it works. Sorry, I just figured it out. Um, so, so you do Amazon Linux uh, extras, uh, kind of enable whatever the topic is, and then you go and install what you think of as kind of a high level package in the in there, which has is a meta package, and then kind of gets all its dependencies. Um, and so when it uh, when you enable it, it says, hey, we recommend you use you know, basically this, um, you know, this name of the Postgres RPM. Um, so you have a few things there. Um, so we have this kind of concept in modularity called profiles, which allow you to have different uh, use cases for a given piece of software. So Postgres, you might have client, you might have server, right? You'll get different RPMs installed depending on which profile you use. Um, this has basically a single profile. Uh, that you use, and then um, and then the other thing that I, I don't really like about it, but is is not anything particularly necessarily wrong with it, is that it uses name mangling to separate um, the different versions of Postgres. Uh, so it is Postgres SQL one zero is the name, um, rather than kind of using the version number in, in some kind of proper metadata area. Um, so those are a few things that I found um, challenging about it, but it does work. Um, you know, it's uh, it's available today. Um, you can. Uh, I don't. I didn't see a way um, to kind of use it offline, even though you can use Amazon Linux two offline. Um, you can actually download the distro. Um, but obviously, you know, most of our RPM repos are online anyway, so that's not too big a deal. Um, the other interesting thing that I thought was that uh, they actually use a, their CDN network. Um, with basically individual hashes uh, for each of the RPMs, um, rather than there being like a, a web page, right, that you can go to and actually kind of see everything in the repo, uh, which I also thought was interesting, but again, not really a fault, just different. Um, sorry, apparently I was talking a long time. Um, all right, so that's Amazon Linux Extras. Um, any questions on that? All right, we'll see how we do on demos. All right, so SUSE modules um, is another relatively new thing um, and is, as far as last I looked, is only available for the enterprise version. Um, and this is uh, a, like seven or so uh, different repositories that have kind of, uh, kind of a, I hate to use the word topic, but kind of a topic area um, that uh, bring uh, new versions of software together that are related to that topic. So like there's a web development one that might have new versions of PHP and might have new versions of you know, web servers, et cetera. Um, but they're kind of all bundled into one repo. Um, they are, as far as I can tell, essentially similar to like RHEL extras or like RPM Fusion in a sense. Like here is an extra repository that has new, or let's say different, potentially newer versions of software um, and made available uh, to the end user um, in a supported way in terms of, uh, you know, for enterprise uh, SUSE. Um, and, you know, so they have this kind of web and scripting was one of them, legacy is another one, um, and there's a bunch of others. Um, but essentially you're just adding uh, the equivalent of rel extras or rel, um, it's not quite like optional, but um, more like extras. So it's pretty straightforward, um, and I love that the massive name collision is confusing. Um, so I guess I already said this. Um, you know, and, and I, I don't know where they're going with this. It's a little hard to tell. There hasn't really been updates of like additional um, of these buckets um, in the time I've been looking at it. Um, so I think it's just you know customer demand. It's getting very warm in here. Um, 
All right, so the next one that I think is really interesting is um, NixOS and, and Wix. Um, so the way this works is um, quite different in that when you install a particular piece of software, it actually kind of puts it in a non-standard location and then essentially adds in sim links to the correct location or from the correct location to the this alternate location and it'll so as a result um, it allows for full parallel installation as well as parallel availability so you can have a complete clone of you know whatever set of libraries um, and then it provides them to each application uh, so it's it's very sophisticated um, and uh, and it, it seems to work well uh, I haven't run into too many problems with it um, and it's, you know, it kind of uses, they have a bunch of other nice features like um, the entire OS is actually, it does the atomic thing where, um, you know, you kind of have infinite rollback and even, it even adds it to Grub um, so that, you know, if you try to do an install and it fails, you can always roll back. Um, it uses a declarative um, mechanism for describing the configuration of your, of your entire OS. Um, so it's really nice uh, and it works quite well. However, um, and I don't know if I put this on a slide, um, yeah, so the user adoption is tough because it's completely different. Like you, you know, the package, like the usage of the package management and stuff is just not, you know, it's not DNF and Yelp, right? It's, it's quite different. Um, and how you approach managing your system is quite different because you use this declarative syntax inside of a configuration file uh, that kind of declares, I want Thunderbird. Um, versus, you know, what I, I think of as what we would do normally is, you know, yum install, blah, blah, blah. In a sense, it's actually more like managing a system with Ansible. So in that way, it is similar, but um, like for general user adoption, it's pretty tough. Um, even though, like I said, I really like it. Um, the other massive problem is it requires new packaging, right? So our 21,000 or something packages, all we need new packaging. Um, and then, but, to the, end, to the end point, it is a very, um, you know, it is a, it is a good solution. It's good at what it does. Um, and it may be, even if we adopt, you know, kind of stuck with our RPMs, et cetera, um, it might be a good way to shift if we wanted to get to parallel installation. Um, go ahead, Dad. I'm just curious, uh, did anybody investigate trying to change uh, RPM build and RPM on the back end to do this instead of trying to rebuild the world? Yeah, so the question is basically, could we in, um, you know, in, in the things that build RPMs, in a sense, um, cause the output to uh, result in something like the, the next symlink tree, like this guy? Um, so it was kind of toyed around with. Um, you know, the, there's other, the problem is you also have to kind of convince the applications. So you have to pass that information to the applications as well. Um, so like you have to tell them which set of symlinks to be using. Um, Why? So like if you have parallel installation, uh -huh. you need, um, so if application A is using library foo version two and application B is using library foo version three, you also need to pass that information to the applications themselves. Um, and with the sim links, you can. I'm trying to remember how Nix does it. Um, we, I mean, we, we can talk about this offline. Yeah, I, sure. I have I, I have ideas of how yeah we could do that. So I think I actually with, so without I much, having to change application context, I think we can lie to it about it. Yeah. So so basically, the comment is like you know, are there mechanisms that we could use to make this result but transparent to both the applications and the users and the maintainers? Yeah. Um, and I think it is potentially possible. Um, I don't think it's trivial. No, it's not trivial. We might also break everything. But right. We could try it. Right. Yeah. Um, all right, so go ahead. So in Fedora, we have NVRs in our RPM names. How are these identified in the file system? Um, Repeat. Well, like the RPM is in Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. So the question is like, how are the different versions identified in the file system? Um, we don't actually identify them in the file system, right? We use them in the RPM database. Um, it's kind of similar, is that it keeps track of, of where, what it put where. Um, and so when you try to install it again, but there's no conflicts 
because you can have parallel installation. It, right, but if I was like looking at the distribution and I saw there was a core utils, like how is it, what is a file name that contains core utils 825? It's, it's, a, it's a directory in a, with a UUID. Yeah, it, like yeah. it creates a UUID, places it in there, and that hash is generated at build time. So there's a there's a discoverable mapping. Right. So the so tooling, when you go to query the system, will tell you where it's at. Yeah. Sorry. So the the question was, um, you know, how do you how do you track down where, like, what version of something that you're actually you know have installed or you're using, and when it puts it in this alternate location, it actually is this. It's yeah, kind of like a UID, but basically there's this generated hash that is actually the input into the hash is um, directly made from the binaries and all of its dependencies. So you can, I think you can even reverse it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you can reverse the, the hash and know exactly all the things that um, built it as well as it runs with. Um, and that's where it kind of gets stored off um, under... Uh, Maybe I can't remember now. But how is it distributed? Oh, typical package management like repos. Um, and what's interesting about it actually is that it will check the, the Nix repo, um, and if it's there, it will pull the binary. But if it's not there, it'll actually build it locally, um, uh, which is kind of neat. So you get both that kind of source and uh, binary distribution mechanism at the same time. Um, and so what what further or what follows from that is that if you modify one of their spec files. Uh, locally, and then you know, kind of install it. It will um, rebuild it locally. It'll be your custom build with whatever your changes are. Um, like I said, it's really it's really quite sophisticated. Um, and I, I think to Adam's point, I think there's a lot of things we could learn from it. Um, that, but it's just it's going to take a while. And what I think modularity, one of the big drivers of modularity, was really about um, uh, getting our flexibility back. Uh, and so big changes to the infrastructure that allow us to do new things. Um, and so I think the, the steps following from here in modularity are about like how can we now take advantage of that new flexibility about how we build things and maybe t maybe start to think about things like this. Um, you know, so that's kind of the idea. Um, let's see, what else I got in here? So then we move on to modularity. Um, uh, let me just, uh, can I say show of hands, like, do we want to talk about modularity itself? Yes? Raise your hand. All right, cool. All right, so um, the idea of modularity, um, you know, what I was trying to point out in some of the earlier slides, right, is like these are some approaches that uh, people are taking, um, with the exception of Nix, um, both Amazon Linux 2 and SUSE are both post us doing modularity. Um, so I don't know if they were following and, and used some ideas from us or whatever, but we, we haven't really been able to take advantage of looking at their stuff and applying it back, you know, where there might be lessons learned um, because they're pretty new. Um, but this is kind of the idea with modularity is that we're trying to stop being, uh, or trying to stop being focused on the RPM as um, the, the know everything component. Um, because we have this like kind of mindset that we, you know, that in our source tree, you know, it just leads us to this binary, and everything's wrapped around this like RPM binary, um, both our distribution mechanisms as well as our, um, as well as how we build them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it's very, very difficult for us to look at, to be able to kind of build or understand in our system sense anything that isn't an RPM. Um, and so what Modularity wanted to do, is trying to do, right, is kind of take a step back from that a little bit and say, can we describe things in terms of essentially source um, and then result in binaries where the binary artifact is just one output type rather than being a be the be-all and end-all of the entire pipeline. So right now our pipeline, or not anymore I guess, um, but before modularity started is our pipeline knew how to build RPM basically and that's it. It didn't know that it was dealing with different sources and that kind of stuff. And so as a result, over the years, it's been very difficult to build things like jars, right? Or very difficult to build containers um, because they're different output artifacts than our build system knew about. So what modularity is trying to do is say, okay, can we describe things in terms of the source control or in terms of the... Um, you know, basically a pointer into the source tree, and then 
kind of in inject things like spec files or whatever later on in the process, so then we can kind of build up these binaries and result in different kinds of output artifacts. So kind of that's where we kind of started from, and so what we led to is that, okay, so we can describe what the pointers in the source tree are through this thing called a module MD file, um, which is basically just a YAML file with pointers, um, and then we can kind of build that as a collective set. We can build them all together um, and we can make them rely on each other and we know that they were built together so they'll work together. Um, and then we can ship that now unified component as a unit, right? Because nobody actually cares if they got the libxml2, right? What they care about is the application that depends on it, right? The, you know, which, which libraries they are, et cetera. Nobody Generally, I mean, except for developers, right? But generally, you don't install a library, right? What you're doing is installing an application, and so you want to know that the unit itself works together. And that's where the term module comes from, is that we're trying to describe the, uh, and uh, there's a, a guy at Red Hat, actually, who calls them installable things, uh, which I also kind of like, and then we'd end up with IT, and that would be funny, too. Um, but we, what we care about is the thing that is installable at the endpoint. And so that's what a module is trying to describe. It's trying to describe the thing rather than the individual components without losing um, the uh, decomposition that our camera loves, right? So the decomposition is also really good because then we can share libraries um, across the system. We can have, you know, simplify our, the, what's available, et cetera. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with the module. Uh, so we build the binaries, uh, but we build them as a unit. Um, and then we can decide what kind of artifact output types we want. Right now, we pretty much only build RPMs, and then we secondarily build things like containers. Um, but the flexibility is starting to be in the infrastructure to do something different. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there any uh, price schedule for the different type of content that will be delivered by the majority? Right, so the question is, um, what other types, of, or do we have a timeline for trying to deliver other types of content? Not really. Um, in that what we want to do is have the flexibility to do so. Not, we didn't really have a plan that tomorrow we're going to start shipping gems. I mean, but Fedora 20, 30, 50, as soon as somebody asks for it, we'll, Next we'll yeah, I mean, it, it, so, you know, basically is that... No plans. Yeah, there's no, there's no plan. plan. Is a possibility, nice possibility. Exactly. Right, so the so what we wanted to do was have an architecture that supported that type of change, because like, at the end of the day, like the modularity stuff has some you know like everything else has some end user benefits, um, but the goal was really about making sure that we had the flexibility in our infrastructure to adapt to what users want, right? Um, because what we're trying to get to is kind of what I was getting to earlier in the slides is that we need a way. Oh, went to sleep again. Um, I forgot to install caffeine, sorry. Um, I also apparently don't know my password. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, it, you know, enhance the flexibility, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have a goal for what that flexibility should be used for. You know, we just want to open it up. Um, so yeah, and then we can kind of target um, you know, the output artifacts that we want to have. Um, one of the things that we have not gotten to yet that we wanted to get to and we tried with Atomic um, was can we describe the output artifact as a module MD itself uh, so that we can say, okay, you know, uh, here's the set of components that go into this container type, right? Or this ISO. Um, and so we kind of toyed around with it or whatever, but you know, it, it was a lot of work. So we didn't get to it. But maybe someday. Um, and really, to your point, right, is that what we're trying to do is enable innovation around how the distribution works and how things get done, not so much because we have a particular goal, like I said, of shipping gems tomorrow. Um, it's more about we need more flexibility in the kinds of things we build and the kinds of things we ship because the, the infrastructure has changed for what we need. Um, and then lastly, the goal was um, we wanted to we want a user to not experience any change at all unless they want something that's non-standard. So you know, DNF install PostgreSQL should just work. Um, and if they decide that they want something that is not the current version of PostgreSQL, um, then they can go and choose something different. 
Um, you know, so DNF install, and this is one of the things that modules are, are trying to help with, right? Is like DNF install Postgres SQL, I believe gives you the client, and DNF install, or no, I've got it backwards, sorry. Postgres SQL gives you the server. MariaDB gives you the client. Um, so, you know, with the profiles, we're trying to make it so that you can actually know that there's a client and server available. We know that, but we'll make the defaults to work as much as they do today so that if you type DNF install MariaDB, you get what you expect. But then you can start to work on multiple versions or you can start to work on different profiles uh, by adding a little quote unquote syntactic sugar to your command rather than having to learn a whole new um, application architecture or, you know, mechanism for doing this. Um, and I think that might be all my slides. Um, yeah, I can show you Amazon Linux um, if that would be cool. Um, in theory, um, go ahead. Uh, the network in here is terrible, and I have to bounce to another machine. So, um, yeah, got it. So you you alluded to the fact that this could open up the possibility of shipping other types of artifacts. Has anybody started to map out what that would look like? How we could potentially um, achieve what the curated content stream concept was supposed to? Um, so the question is, has anybody looked at, okay, so um, let me back up for a little bit. So one of the, one of the challenges we have in Fedora land, right, is that um, the application, uh, like application languages um, have many, many libraries, right, huge numbers of them of huge variability and quality. Um, you know, as some of you might have remember, you know, NPM uh, lost uh, one particular library um, and the entire Node.js world fell apart uh, for a few days. Um, so there's all these libraries kind of coming out and coming out and, and some of them continue to be maintained, some don't, et cetera. It's basically impossible for a distribution, a Linux distribution to keep up with that. Um, we have some of those um, languages are very friendly to us and try to help us do that. So Python is a great example, right? So uh, Python tries very hard to make it easy for distributions to distribute them. Um, whereas things like Ruby don't. They do, that's not their goal, you know, gem, um, you know, it just works. Why would you need a distribution in the middle? So there was um, a push a couple of years ago um, to can we stop packaging those things as RPMs and instead find a way to make them available through the normal Fedora infrastructure uh, such that the end user can make choices about getting any you know, library that they want, um, but also understand its quality. Um, so provide the information. And licensing. Sorry? And licensing. And licensing. Um, so, and that, that's actually another example why we can't like automatically generate RPMs from gems, for example, is that it's missing data that we require to create RPMs, um, or it's allowed to miss, be missing data, let's put um, So we were trying to figure out, like, could we, could we share that information directly down to the user from, directly from the upstream so that we wouldn't have to kind of keep up? Um, and one of the ideas there was can we use modules um, to just help solve that or change this infrastructure to help solve that. Um, and I would say yes, the idea has been considered but not really pursued. Um, and, uh, but if anybody out here wants to start a project doing um, content distribution like that, uh, I would be very excited about it. Um, because it, it'd be really useful to have the information that of, you know, like this NPM library how much is it used, you know, who is it used by, um, and, you know, what is its license, et cetera, without having to have had an RPM maintainer look, dig all that information up, right? Um, sorry, so, oh, sorry, I was gonna show you guys a demo, um, in theory. Let's see how many, uh, Sorry, I just blanked on where it was. It's hard to run an OS as a container.
You guys see that all right? Big enough? Yeah. Um, all right, so this is just all I did was download um, their, uh, I, I don't know, some sort of image. I can't remember what type it is. KVM, I assume. Um, and, you know, kind of started digging around. So if you do um, anything with the whole typing, And then you just kind of, oh my god, this may be too slow. Um, so oddly enough, it seems familiar. Kind of looks like the DNF module list. Um, so basically, these are all the different topics you have. Um, it's, it's a little unclear to me whether it's a topic and then it's a version of that topic or if the versions are topics themselves. Like I just don't quite understand their lingo. Um, but that's probably because I'm an idiot, not because it's bad. Um, so, if you, if you see there, I actually have three versions of Postgres enabled um, because I wanted to kind of see what would happen. Uh, and it will now pick Postgres 10, right? Um, because it will always choose latest. Um, and, but you kind of just, you know, do what is, actually, let me just see if I can do it this way. It might be easier. Um, but yeah, so you just see, I just enable it, right? I mean, it's not, you know, not that complex, not dissimilar from what we have. Um, and then I would go along and install it. Um, and, you know, and then I'd get the, the version that I was looking for. Um, the thing is that when you, what I think is kind of interesting is if I try to do, um, yeah, so if you notice the top line there, um, so this is kind of interesting, um, but basically, so if you have installed a library or a, a thing from the topic and then, you know, kind of remove it and disable it, um, I'm not actually sure what they're worried about, but they seem worried, um, that this may not work. Um, so, but you know, as far as I know, young DNF, right, should be able to handle this pretty well, um, uh, without too much trouble. Now I'm curious because I forgot. But I saw in their documentation, I can't type while well, looking over my shoulder. Um, I don't know. So it does say that they have DNF available too, but now I'll have to go dig and figure it out. Um, uh, it's pretty small, it's probably around. Uh, maybe, yeah. It's 800 more bytes. Right, right. Yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll go full around with it at some point. Now I'm curious. Um, so those topics are not part of the tab, right? The latest version has replaced the other one? Right, so the statement is just that they replace the other version of it available. But if you notice, um, I was doing some searches before, um, not everything that is a topic is available currently. So there's no GIMP, for example. The only GIMP you can get is through this topic. But Tomcat, there is a, like a base version available, um, and then there is a topic for Tomcat 8.5. I think the, the base one was 7, maybe. Um, so. There, it's not necessarily required that the thing already exists and then it overrides. It's both. So after you install Tomcat from the topic, you will not have the base, base operating all this uh, Tomcat? So, okay, so the question is, what happens to the base, the Tomcat 7 that's available in the base when you enable the Tomcat 8 um, topic? It's actually exactly what would happen if you got Tomcat 8 from RPM Fusion, is that you just now have two repositories. One has a higher NDR, and so you get the higher NDR. That's it. Good. Um, it's mostly just commentary. I find it interesting that Mate Desktop is 1.x, but Rust is just 1. Yeah, uh, so the comment is basically that the, um, the naming of the versions here, right? So Mate Desktop is 1.x, and what was your other example? Rust. Rust um, one. Yeah, so in Rust just uses a, the numeral 1. Um, I actually think we're going to have the same problem in modularity. Um, awesome. in the, well, it's good and bad. So um, the idea is that some things uh, are good about uh, uh, basically doing like Z stream being only bug fixes, right? And, 
Y stream being um, you know, backwards compatible and X being you know, major changes. Not everything, PHP for example, um, there are breaking changes between PHP Y versions. Um, so the naming convention you end up with is what policy do they follow? Um, and so Rust in theory, and I'm not sure if these are good choices or not for the individual examples, but Rust in theory is doing a good job of only doing breaking changes on X's and make desktop is only doing a good job on Y's. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Apache actually has this problem too. Um, even though like they are actually really good about um, not doing breaking changes on, on minor versions, people don't trust them. So uh, people really want Apache or HTTP 2.2 versus 2.6. Um, so you know we tend to use the minor version there too. Sorry, go ahead. Ed. No, my, my point was just that if if it is a breaking change, it should be a separate stream. Right, so the statement is that if it's a breaking change, it should be a separate stream. Um, yes, so this is actually what's more equivalent to our streams. So we would call the, the module itself make desktop, and then we would have a stream that was 1.19 like this. Actually, what we, this is where the thing I was talking about really would happen. So you would have maybe 1.19 and 1.20 as two separate streams because you didn't trust the Y versions. Yeah, so um, my, my point was, so you have like PostgreSQL 9.6 and that's like a stream that, that tracks something that will have Z stream updates, whereas Mate Desktop doesn't have a 1.19 and a 1.20, pretending that those are breaking changes. I just thought the inconsistent naming was odd. Well, so this, this does not seem to follow. It doesn't. It doesn't. Happen. Well, so the comment basically is that the, the naming is odd. And I will also point out though, it's partially because they're using naming. So they need to inject information into the name no. that gives you what, how to choose the right thing. Yeah, I know. I, so, never mind. <laughs> Adam said we're, we're missing. <laughs> we're, we're talking past each other. All right, Brendan, go ahead. Well, you, you're talking about the ambiguity of the naming convention. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't follow any convention. Well, you think so, maybe it does. Right. <laughs> I was saying, I think hey, it's Brendan's turn. So, as tempting as it is to debug uh, Amazon nomenclature, do we have good guidance for stream names and Fedora models? We're, we're starting, so basically the question is, um, do we have consistent, or do we have policy or whatever documentation uh, around um, how to name things that are related to modularity? Um, we have uh, basically a, a working draft. Um, it's, not, it's not approved yet, it's close. Um, and it's mind-boggling how messed up it got so quickly. Um, so, literally, so I was talking about the different profiles, for example. Um, and when you're talking about a database, right, it's pretty easy. Client, server, right? Um, but let's talk about, uh, say, Apache or something like that, where you might have a, a dev version versus the production version. Yeah, we literally have dev, devel, development, all meaning the same thing on different profiles of different uh, modules. Um, so, yes, we have a working draft. <laughs> no, it is not implemented, and oh my god, it needs to be. Um, so that we have this kind of convention. The other problem we have, let me just make one more point, is, um, is that sometimes we are gonna wanna name uh, modules by, uh, with some bit of name mingling, by using some versioning in there. For example, um, Python, where we might want to do allow for parallel installability because, um, first of all, Python can tolerate it. Second, we have a Python that we use as part of the OS that is not necessarily the same as the Python that the user wants to use. Um, so we need guidance on that as well um, so that uh, some people sort of do it. Consistently. Case because Python already from upstream allows that. Right, but I want consistency in the naming. In, in like how you name the version or the names of the module, so that if it comes up again, they don't get inconsistent. That's all. But sorry, go ahead. Uh, okay, is there any roadmap for the appearance of the one? Yeah, uh, really, it should be in the next few weeks. Next few weeks. Yeah. And just, just a small issue. It will be. Uh, do you plan any restriction for the naming of the strings? Yes, that's in there too. Yeah, and it, restrictions, I mean, it's policy that we expect to change 
Um, you know, it may not be 100% right the first try, but we gotta, we gotta start with something and say, here is the mechanism uh, by how you should choose your stream names and what and how you should you know separate it with hyphens or whatever, um, just so that we get consistency. We may want to change it over time, but at least it'll be consistent yeah. until then. You know. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Anything else I can show you there? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, one, one question I have is, especially when we use like traditional text managers, etc., in comparison to containers, um, which you brought up at the beginning somewhere that all this should somewhere move into the direction of modularity is, well, let's say I want to install Nextcloud and some other PHP application, and one needs PHP 5, one needs PHP 5.4, whatever. Um, when I use traditional package management, and it's defined like this with the uh, relationship to, oh, it has this and this dependencies, of course, this may cause a conflict, and then both, or at least one of the applications won't run. Is there any intention to, to change this, or is it just that... So, let me try to paraphrase. So, basically, the problem is you have two different applications, they're not using the same shared libraries. Um, so, we refer to that problem as the parallel installability problem. Um, and there is no intent to fix that at the moment. You should go use two different user spaces. And the reason I've been using the term user space is right, so that could be in containers, it could mean VMs, it could be, you know, kind of whatever mechanism you want to use. Um, but what I can help you with is that you need PHP 5 and PHP 6, they'll both be available. So when you build your container to do both applications, you can actually get those applications, both of them, even though they're not using um, the same versions of things. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting here, too, is because we are using this defaults infrastructure, um, if you have a container that is, uh, you know, using PHP um, and you know that you want it to walk, um, you know, major versions or you want it to walk, like something, you want it to walk major versions, because we are doing this default stuff, you can actually inject a different file into Etsy with a different set of defaults than what is standard. So when in your Docker file, you can say DNF install um, PHP, and you'll just get the right version. So um, that's also kind of a cool thing. I think Adam wants me to stop, I, I can't tell. Um, so, uh, but yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, hopefully it's useful.